Does the fossil record really support evolution? Does the fossil record really support millions of years of death, decay, and struggle? Well, I want to welcome you to Creation Radio and TV. I'm your host, Mike Riddle, and today our session is about the fossil record. And we'll start with this question. Why is the fossil record important to Christians? Well, the answer to that is because it will help us understand what we believe about God's Word, specifically in three areas. Number one, the authority of Scripture. Does the Bible really mean what it says, or can we reinterpret it based on what we believe about the scientific evidence? Number two, it will help us understand the foundation for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And number three, it will help us understand the very character of God. So let's take a look at all three of those before we get into the scientific evidence. Number one, the authority of Scripture. The Bible teaches that God created everything after its kind. Well, if the fossil record is a record of millions of years of death, decay, and struggle, then that part of God's Word is not true. The Bible also teaches that God created everything in six literal days. And He even wrote this down in the Ten Commandments, and we can read this in Exodus 20, verse 11, where He wrote, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Now, if the days of creation are not literal days, as the Bible clearly states, then when should we believe the plain reading of Scripture? And when does Scripture make any sense, and who's going to make the rules? In other words, do numbers have any kind of meaning at all in the Bible, or should we just to take them as an allegory and make them mean whatever we want them? For example, how long was Jonah in the big fish? Was it really three days? Or we can just open that up to whatever we want it to mean. How long and how many times did Israelites mark around the, march around the city of Jericho before the walls fell? Or is that open to our interpretation also? Now how about this one? What about Jesus in the wilderness? Was he really there for 40 days? As it states in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, where we read, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And we had finished fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Afterward, he was hungry. Does it really mean 40 days and 40 nights there? Or can we just reinterpret that to be, oh, that's just a spiritual statement. But how about this one? What about the resurrection? Did Jesus really die on that cross? And was he really raised from the dead on the third day? Does the third day really mean the third day? See, if it doesn't mean real days in Genesis chapter 1, why do we take it to mean the third day? Could have been the fourth day, fifth day, or maybe it was just after a few hours. You see, once we start reinterpreting God's Word based on what we believe about the scientific evidence, then what are we going to do with the Bible? See, it no longer is God's Word to us. It more becomes man's wisdom. See, when we read text, such as the Bible, or any other text, there are certain rules we need to abide by. And that rule is context. We should take words in the context where they are used to discover the intended meaning, not add thing to God's Word. Now, second part of the Bible is called the foundation for the gospel. Now, there are two interpretations for the fossil record. One is the evolution story where the fossils were laid down over millions and millions of years, which gives us millions and millions of years of death, decay, and struggle. Ladies and gentlemen, that would mean millions of years of death before sin. In other words, that affects the very foundation for the gospel of Jesus Christ, because once you believe the fossil record is a history of millions of years of death, you are now believing and teaching death before sin. Now, I have a question about that. If that's what you believe, then why did Jesus have to physically come to this planet, physically die on that cross, and be physically raised from the dead if death was not the result of sin? You see, we've lost our foundation for the gospel. But the other story is that God created a worldwide flood, and it was the cause of most all our fossils we see today. And that would have all happened, as it says in the Bible, after the fall. So those are our two accounts. Do you really believe in death, decay, and disease before sin? Or do we believe the authority of God's Word that there was a worldwide flood which caused most all the fossils? Now, let's go to number three, the character of God. You see, what we believe about the fossil record affects what we believe about the character of God. 
In Genesis 1.31, God states His creation was perfect. And we read this in Genesis 1.31. Then God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. So the evening and morning were the sixth day. In other words, God stated that His creation was perfect, very good, which means no death and decay. Oh, wait a minute now. If you're believing the fossil record is a history of millions of years of death, decay, and disease, then what you're now believing is that God called death, decay, and disease very good. That's a different God that I see in the Bible. That's some other God, but certainly not the God of the Bible who called death, decay, and disease very good. Because I read in the Bible, in the New Testament, it says death is the last enemy. It's not very good. It is an enemy. So we've got to throw that scripture away if we believe in the evolutionary story of the fossil record. But now, let's examine what we actually find. You see, the, the fossil record, what we believe about it, does affect our belief in God's Word. But what does the scientific evidence give us? What do we really see in the scientific evidence? Well, let's start with something called the Cambrian Explosion. Now, the picture you see up here is a typical picture we see in our textbooks. It's a history of geologic columns in the geologic history of the world. And what we see in there is the whole history of the fossil record. On the very bottom we see the least complex creatures. As we move up the column we see more and more complex creatures. What I'd like to do is just go down to the bottom layers. Just the bottom layers. Those are called the Precambrian layers and the Cambrian layers. Now why is that so important? Well what we find down there are fossils of single cells. Yes we do find those. Fossils of single cells. Then we also find very complex creatures such as seashells, trilobites, jellyfish, even some forms of fish down there. Now, what's so amazing about all that? Well, the amazing part is there are no transitions to be found leading from a single cell up to these very complex creatures. Almost every body shape or type appears in the fossil record with no transitions leading up to it. Let's read what the scientists have to say about this. Norman Nevin, who is a professor of medical genetics, states this. The evidence points to the appearance of many new animal forms and body plans in fossils without transitional fossils or common ancestors. In early Cambrian rocks, as many as 35 phyla and between 32 to 48 subphyla and classes of animals appeared abruptly. Apparently from nowhere at all, fully formed with no fossil evidence that they branched off from common ancestors. Did you get what he just said there? No transitions leading up to these complex creatures. Now in the book Integrative and Comparative Biology we read this. Understanding how diverse body plans evolve remains one of the most exciting and challenging goals for evolutionary and developmental biologists alike. Did you get what he just said there? Can't find any transitions, but it's an exciting adventure to see if we can find any. Well, folks, we've had many, many, many years of searching and still have no factual transitions leading up to all these incredibly complex creatures. It's as if, as the Bible states, they were created after their kind, and that seems to be the fact. Now, the scientists do know the Cambrian explosion is a problem for evolutionists, as we read this again. As Darwin noted in The Origin of Species, the abrupt emergence of anthropods in the fossil record during the Cambrian presents a problem for evolutionary biology. There are no obvious simpler or intermediate forms, either living or in the fossil record. Wow! Scientist after scientist note this is a major problem for the evolutionists, no transitions. But there is deception going on in our public schools today. Let me read to you a quote from one of our modern biology textbooks. After all those scientists have made those claims, no transitions, here's what our biology textbooks are teaching our children. Paleontologists called the diversification of life during the early Cambrian period the Cambrian Explosion. For the first time, organisms had hard parts, including shells and outer skeletons. During the Cambrian period, the first known representatives of most animal phyla evolved. Did you get what they just said there? Evolution. All these creatures, these tremendously complex creatures, evolved. 
Now, let me tell you what they're not saying. This is what they don't teach in the public schools. It's called science, the observable science. Nowhere in this textbook do they state no transitions have been found to support their claim of evolution. Nowhere do they make this statement. Folks, that is not education. That is deception and misleading information. Our teachers need to get in and start teaching the true science, not hide behind the stories of evolutionism. We need to get back to real education. Now, if evolution calls, evolutionists call themselves scientific, if they say evolution is a scientific theory, then why must they hide behind deception and misinformation? Possibly because there is no real science to support evolution. Possibly because evolution is nothing more than a philosophy or world view. Now, I'd like to take you to a, another part in our talk here. I'd like to give us a quiz. I'd like to give you a quiz out there. Now, on this quiz, we're going to have 10 questions. And let's see if we can get all these correct. It's not a hard quiz. It's not going to be a hard quiz. But let's see if we can get all 10 of these correct. What I'm going to show you is a fossil and then a living creature. Let's start with number one, turtles. On the left-hand side of this picture, you see a fossil turtle. On the right side, you see a living turtle. Now, I have a question. What does a fossil turtle look like? It looks like a turtle today. In other words, no evolution. Turtles have always looked like turtles. Now, let's look at another one. Now, in this picture, we see fossil imprints of spiders. And they clearly are recognizable. They are spiders. In other words, spiders have always looked like spiders. Let's look at another one. Now, according to evolutionists, what we have on the left-hand side here is a fossil of a 400-million-year-old starfish. And on the right, we have a picture of a living starfish. What does a 400-million-year-old starfish look like? A starfish. No changes in these alleged 400 million years. Now, let's go to another one. Now, according to evolutionists, what you see on the left-hand side there is a fossil of a 50-million-year-old bat. And guess what they look like? Bats today. No change in those alleged 50 million years. Here's another one. On the left side, we see a fossil of a crab. And guess what they look like? Crabs living today. No change. Here's another one. On the left side, you see a fossil of a shrimp. And they look just like shrimps look today. Again, no change. Here's another one. On the left side, we have fossils of dragonflies. And there again, no real change. Another one. On the left-hand side, we have a fossil of a horseshoe crab. No change in all these alleged years. Now let's look at another one there. On the left-hand side, we have the fossil of a seahorse. No change. And finally, here are some fossils of frogs. And they're easily recognizable to be frogs. No change. Now, I hope all of you got 100% on this quiz. The question I have for us is, where's the evolution here? These creatures have not changed in all these alleged evolutionary years. No change at all. Where is the evolution? See, this is what we actually do observe in the fossil record. Slight variations within kind, but no real transitions. The only place we're really finding transitions today are in textbooks, and these pictures are drawn by artists. Now let's look at just a few more. Here's a picture of what evolutionists call a 100 million year old fossil of an alligator. It looks like alligators today, no change. Here's another one, a fossil of a 100 million year old fish called a coelacanth. And it looks exactly like coelacanths look today, no change. And here's the tuatara lizard, no change in over 130 million years. Where is the evolution. Perhaps they need to hire some more artists. Now, if evolution was really true, if evolution was really true, we should find some real transitions. Let me show you what these transitions might look like. For example, how about the gator bird? That would be a very interesting transition, wouldn't it? Here's another one. How about what I call the bunny cat? There would be another amazing transition. Or here's another one I call the rhino melon. Watch out for going out in your garden. You might find one of these. How about the bird dog? Or how about this one? 
the Sparrow Boxer. How'd you like to have that one on your finger? Or how about this one, the Improved Polar Bear. Now look closely at this one and count the legs. That would be a great transition. Or how about this one, the Sheep Wolf. Now that one really is a transition. You know where we find sheep wolves? How about inside many churches today? Wolves dressed in sheep's clothing, teaching false doctrines. Or how about this one? Watch out for going in the water. How about the cat shark? And how about this final one? Only a face a mother might love. How about the Catrilla? Now these are not real transitions, but just computer artwork here. But if we really found transitions, we should find something that's amazingly a transition, not slight differences, such as the dog kind. We know dogs can vary within kind. We know cats can vary within kind. But folks, that is not evolution. That's just called genetic variability. Now let's go to our next piece here about science. I call this critical thinking. And I'd like to give you what I call a critical thinking question. Every one of our high school and junior high students should be armed with this question when they walk into the classroom. They should be thinking about this when they see pictures of transitions or asking this question of the teacher. How much of that fossil was actually found and how much was added, meaning drawn in by the artist? Did you get that? How much of the fossil was actually found and how much was added in by the artist? Now let's use a biology textbook for our example here. And I'll give, read you a quote from a modern biology textbook and it deals with whale evolution and it states, for instance, modern whales are the descendants of four-legged land animals. And here is the picture they're putting in the textbooks to support this claim. Now this picture is very deceptive. Why? Because this is not what was found. What this picture is, is a picture drawn by artists, but does not represent the actual fossils that were found. Now let's take a look at some examples that have been used to support whale evolution in the textbooks in the past and in the present. Let's take, for example, a creature called Pachycetus. Pachycetus was called a candidate for whale evolution. And here's a picture that we find in journals and we even find in some previous textbooks, Pachycetus, half whale, half mammal. Now, let me put another picture up there and let's ask this question. How much of the fossil was actually found to draw that picture and how much was added in? Well, the picture you're seeing up here is a skull of Pachycetus. What was found? Only the shaded portions. No other part of the body was found. Isn't that incredible? From those few fragments of a skull, they drew this amazing creature and, creature and called this a transitional creature between a wolf-like creature and a whale. Now later, the rest of the fossil evidence was discovered, and it did not look like a whale at all. Matter of fact, it resembled a wolf-like creature capable of running on land, and here is what those pictures actually look like. This does not look like an aquatic creature at all. Again, a misinterpretation of of the evidence by the evolutionist. Now let's look at another one. Rhodocetus, still in the textbooks today as a transition between a land animal and a whale. Now the question is how much of that fossil was actually found and how much was added in by the artist? Now the picture you see up here, the X's represent those parts that were also not found. In other words, no part of the fin, the tail, or the leg, burn, the leg bones were discovered. Only the parts I've outlined in the rectangles were found. None of these other parts were found. That is a misrepresentation again of the evidence, but that is what's being taught in the schools. The philosophy of evolution has a record of mistakes and deception. For example, Nebraska man. They use that to try and represent the history of ape-like creatures evolving humans. What did they find? A tooth, only a tooth, and they're able to display the entire creature Nebraska man. And the tooth didn't turn out to be a tooth of an ape or a human, it turned out to be a pig's tooth, folks. A grave mistake by the evolutionists. Then there was Piltdown Man, used in the schools for over 40 years to represent the fact of evolution, when in fact all they found was a portion of a skull, some jawbone, and some teeth and the bones had been chemically stained to make them appear old, and the teeth had file marks on to make them fit. The whole thing was recognized as a fraud, but for 40 years it was taught in the textbooks. 
Then there's Archaeoraptor, a more recent discovery in the 1990s. Archaeoraptor, proof that dinosaurs evolved into birds. The big problem was it didn't have real feathers on it, folks. What had happened was somebody pasted feather imprints onto the bones. Again, another fraud used to support evolutionism. Then there was the coelacanth, the fish they thought was evolving into an amphibian, growing legs. It was supposed to be extinct for over 65 million years, but yet that's how they taught it. A fish growing legs, but guess what we found in the early 1900s? Coelacanths still living. They were not extinct for 65 million years. They're still living today. And guess what we found out about them? No legs at all. Again, a complete misinterpretation of the fossil evidence to support evolution. When will they stick to just the facts? When, do they, when will they stop the misleading information in our schools? Why can't they just give the true science? Possibly because evolution cannot be supported scientifically. And let's go to our last part. Fossil graveyards. Now, how are fossils formed? Well, first of all, the creature must be buried rapidly to keep, this, keep the oxygen out and the scavengers away. Then it has potential to become a fossil. Well, what do we mean by fossil graveyards? Those are places where we find hundreds and sometimes thousands of creatures all buried together. And we find these fossil graveyards all over the world. And guess what we find them in? Sediments laid down by water. Let's take a look at several examples. In, in Nebraska, in Agate Springs, a fossil graveyard of about 9,000 animals, such as rhinos, horses, camels, boars, birds, plants, trees, seashells, all buried and fossilized together in sediments laid down by water. And incidentally, all those creatures don't live in the same zones. In Alberta, Canada, there's a huge graveyard that stretches for hundreds of miles and holds many dinosaur bones. And then there's a repository of fossils that were found in South Africa. The Karoo Formation in South Africa alone contains fossil remains of millions of animals. Richard Milner in the Encyclopedia of Evolution made this statement about that fossil graveyard. Only a catastrophe operating on a continental scale would be sufficient to account for this. Did you get what he just said there? A catastrophe that covers an entire continent. Sounds like a worldwide flood. Then we have in Wyoming, the Como Bluffs. Dinosaur graveyard, seven miles long, containing 483 dinosaurs, all buried in sediments laid down by water. The Cleveland Lloyd Quarry in Utah, over 12,000 bones belonging to at least 74 individual dinosaurs discovered. Alaska and Siberia, a graveyard of many, many different types of creatures. Dinosaur National Monument in Utah, a fossil graveyard containing over 1,600 bones of 11 different species of dinosaurs. The Grand Canyon, billions of nautiloid creatures, seashells in a seven-foot thick area in the Grand Canyon, billions of these creatures. Now, these creatures don't live on land, they live in the bottom parts of the ocean. And the Grand Canyon's a mile above sea level. How did all these creatures get in there? Sounds like a worldwide flood. France, hundreds of thousands of marine creatures buried with amphibians and spiders and scorpions, millipedes, and reptiles. Germany, another large fossil graveyard. 6,000 types of fossils, vertebrae, were found there. Fossil graveyards, I believe, are powerful evidence of a worldwide flood and not long, slow processes because these creatures all had to be buried rapidly to have fossil potential. So what can we conclude about all this? Well, Norman Nevin, again, a professor of medical genetics, makes this statement. The fossil record does not show a continuous, gradual evolution, but rather an abrupt and sudden emergence of new life forms. Many organisms appear without known ancestors. Indeed, some life forms persist, persist in the fossil record virtually unchanged throughout geologic history. Eugene Koonin, PhD in molecular biology, makes this statement. Major transitions in biological evolution show the same pattern of sudden emergence of diverse forms at a new level of complexity. In other words, the fossil record does not show evolution to be true. 
In other words, the Cambrian explosion confirms what the Bible teaches. God created everything after its kind. Number two, the lack of transitional fossils confirm the Bible. God created everything after its kind. The deception used in textbooks and education system to support evolution demonstrates clearly evolution cannot be supported scientifically. Four, fossil graveyards confirm the biblical account of a worldwide flood. And number five, the only explanation for the fossil record has to be a worldwide flood, exactly as the Bible describes it. Thank you, and God bless you. If these lessons had been a blessing to you, you might consider financially supporting the Ministry of Creation Training Initiative. You can do this by going to our website, creationtraining.org. Again, that's creationtraining.org. Your tax-deductible donation of just $20, $50 or more a month, or a one-time gift of any amount will make you an education partner in building an army of Christian educators who can teach the biblical account of creation and train others to be able to defend their faith and be biblically faithful to God's word as it states in 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear.